Okay, right. It's 9.59. Uh, I think this is recording automatically. So people that can't join live. Yeah, there we go. Um, are able to watch. So I'll, I'll make a start. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, uh, we're here to talk about how to get more done in the time you have. So how to be more productive, uh, basically. My name is uh, Rhiannon. I'm one of the two Odessi directors. And um, some of you on this call know us already. Fantastic, hi. And there are a couple of people whose names um, I don't recognize. Uh, so if you've not come across us before, our purpose is to inspire continuous improvements in organizations that have a social purpose. And when I say social purpose, I mean organizations that have a purpose that transcends a profit motive. So we work a lot with social housing, local authorities and the charities. And we've done work with like, criminal justice and central government and, and organizations like that as well but it's that having a motive beyond a, a profit motive um, that makes you a social purpose organization and, and we'll work with you and we do uh, performance improvement sustainable performance improvement um, and you know that that's who we are really and if you're interested in why we hunker down on continuous improvement then definitely make sure you sign up to our newsletter because we've got one coming out tomorrow morning that talks uh, to that point exactly Okay, um, let's uh, let's have a look at what we're here today to talk about. All right, productivity or productivity tree, <laughs> if you like, and you can see on this slide here. So uh, what I'm going to do is walk you through different stages to ensure that you are able to maximize your your productivity without just telling people to to work harder. Okay, and we've got a series of stages to go through, starting with looking at tasks that are furthering your purpose. OK, and if you've ever seen Simon Sinek, you'll know he talks a lot about the why he even had a book start with why, um, which is basically about finding your purpose. Um, and it's easier said than done. Um, we've obviously thought about it a lot at Desi, hence the inspiring continuous improvement uh, line that you saw at the start. And all teams, all organizations have a purpose. It's different to your motive. It's the why you are doing what you are doing. And what we have here are a few prompts to help you identify those tasks that are furthering your purpose, that, that, that are your why, if you like. So we would always start here from a productivity point of view. If you're doing things that aren't helping you further your purpose, as an individual in the organization that aren't helping to further the organization's purpose or your team's purpose, then you should probably be questioning why you do them at all. But in order to do that, you have to be able to, um, to, to know what your purpose is. So some of the prompts that might help at this point, and I will circulate these um, afterwards. In fact, we have a member of Team Odessi on this uh, webinar today, Sam, who is sketchnoting this whole thing. So all of the key points will be, will be on there and that will get circulated to you afterwards. But some of the prompts, what are you here to achieve? Who are your customers? And that question can be really simple to answer and it can be really hard to answer. Um, so if you are, you know, in social housing, it's probably the people that, you know, are in your properties that are your customers. I always uh, give the example from when I worked in criminal justice, which was my life before Odessi, and I come back to a court setting really hard to identify the customer in a court setting uh, because the customer changes with the proceedings right so sometimes it's the the victim quite rightly sometimes it's the defendant to get the right outcome sometimes it's the general public sometimes it's the jury so identifying the customers can be a really easy thing or a really difficult thing one way to identify your customer is to say if i got rid of this service who would suffer so if we just didn't do this at all who would directly suffer as a result. And that usually helps you find your customer. You get incidental customers. They are customers because the process exists. They're sometimes stakeholders. But who is your, your fundamental customers? And what do they require of you? Okay. And then, yeah, as I've already jumped ahead to, if you stopped doing this, would anybody uh, miss it? So 
yeah, look at the tasks that you're doing and say, if I just took that away, would anybody miss it? I remember doing that myself um, in my probation days. I used to produce a load of reports. Somebody unfortunately went on long-term sick leave and I just stopped doing the reports that went to that person and no one in their team asked for that information. Um, so it clearly wasn't value adding. It wasn't helping to further the purpose of the organization. Other some, otherwise, somebody would be asking for it. So if you stop doing it, would anybody miss it? And if you spent more time on this task, would it be a good thing? And this is a really interesting question to ask. You know, if it took twice as long to pull this piece of information together or to do this particular job, would anybody mind? And sometimes that's really helpful to identify whether it's really a valuable thing you're doing or not. But all of those questions are quite useful prompts to help you identify the tasks that are furthering your purpose. So what are you here to achieve? Who are my customers and what do they require of me? And if I stopped doing this task, would anyone miss it? Or if I spent more time on the task, would it be a good thing? So start there. If the task is not furthering your purpose, then that is something that you can, that you can scrap. Okay. So we'll go back to that model. The next stage of which is to say, which task should I delegate? So we've gone through our first stage. Is the task furthering your purpose? Fundamental, right? If it's not, scrap it. There's a few hours you might get back in the day or even a few minutes. It's, it can be reinvested in something that's value adding. That's a few minutes that you can take a proper break. It's a few minutes where you can um, you know, finish on time. It's a few minutes where you're not working through the evening. Or a few hours you might spend on something else value adding, depending on where you're starting from. Okay, so let's assume it is furthering your purpose. It is a task you need to do. The next question, um, it's something I'm very guilty of, um, is, is really assessing, are you the best person to complete these tasks? Sometimes we do tasks because we find them interesting. Yes, it's, it's something that you have an interest in, but you might not be the best person to do it. There's probably somebody, uh, you know, better qualified um, that can pick up these tasks for you. So let's look now at this. Am I the best person to complete these tasks? And if you're not, then the outcome we're looking for is to delegate the task to the person that is right to do it. And the reason I say this is not that Obviously, I want to just pass stuff off to other people. Um, it's because the person that should do the task or is best suited to doing the task will be able to do it 10 times quicker than you if you're not the right person to do it. OK, um, so let's have a look at that in more detail. And I never used to have a model around this, but then I thought about the Eisenhower matrix. I don't know if many of you have seen the Eisenhower matrix before. It's it's um, it's a really interesting um, model, but it basically tells you if you look at your to do list and you put them in these categories, uh, it tells you what you what you do with them. And I'm just going to refer to my notes at this point. Can, I hope you can still see my slide. But. You've got these uh, these four quadrants um, that basically looks at this definition of is it important or is it urgent? It comes from the, the president, the 34th president of the United States, um, uh, who sort of sparked this idea for the Eisenhower matrix because he um, he basically he there was a quote attributed to him that says I have two kinds of problem uh, the urgent and the important and the urgent are not important and the important are never urgent okay make of that what you will and then Stephen Covey um, who's an author and you probably read the book the seven habits of highly effective people I, I really recommend that that book it's really short but really good I've got some other book recommendations at the end but uh, Stephen Covey he took those words and used them to develop this this model and called it after him the Eisenhower matrix um, so it's like a time management matrix really and you say is the task urgent or is it important and it helps you divide your tasks into those categories um, and basically um, you either schedule them or you do them right now you delegate them or you scrap them um, or, or delete them as the module mod the model says okay um, uh, so yeah, so you go through your to-do list, you put them in those categories, um, and then you do what it says on those categories. So the do quadrant, you place tasks that are urgent and important. Um, yeah, uh, so you get those done and you get those done quickly because they're likely to be stressing you out the most. The schedule uh, quadrant is where things that go that aren't urgent but are still important. So these might affect your long-term goals but don't need to be done right away. 
Okay, so they're not, you don't need to do them right now, but they are sort of purpose furthering really important jobs. Um, the quadrant three is the delegate, right? So you put the things there that are urgent, but not important. Uh, also things that, you know, aren't, aren't for you, basically. So they've got to be done now. They don't affect your long-term goals. Um, and uh, ideally they are best suited to somebody else, but it also as well as being a good way to manage your workload, it gives your, your, your team the opportunity to expand their skill set or to utilize their skill set as well. Okay. Um, and then anything that's left over, right, is not going to be urgent and is not important. So it gets scrapped. Okay. Uh, and that's how you use the Eisenhower matrix. It's really good for helping you identify those that aren't purpose um, furthering, as we discussed on, on the last slide. It's also really good for helping you find those tasks that really should be delegated as well. Um, and also whether they form part of your to-do list or whether it's a, a just do it task. If it's urgent and important, you just do it. Otherwise it gets added to your, your, to your, you know, your ongoing um, to-do list. Um, yeah. I don't know how many people have seen that before. Um, I do very much recommend that as a, as a way to help manage your tasks through the day. Okay. Um, I should have said at the start, sorry, I'm not really good at, um, uh, you know, formal webinars and things. I'm used to seeing faces. Um, but well, I should have said there is the chat function available to you in the Q&A. Um, it is just me on the meeting. I will keep an eye on it. And if any questions come up, I'll either get to them straight away or I'll make sure I pause at the end to address any questions you have. But please, you know, keep them coming in. I can also um, unhide people uh, from a webinar so you can come and, you know, chat at the end or part way through if you want to discuss anything. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. And um, I am here. This is not a recording. Uh, hello. <laughs> um, I put the video off because I've been told it's distracting to see someone in the top corner when you're watching a webinar. So, yeah. Uh, so uh, still just sat here running through this, um, but I'm going to turn the video off so you've not got to watch a little version of me in the top corner. Okay. Um, so, yes, that's the, that's the Eisenhower matrix. Really good for identifying those, those purpose furthering tasks, also for identifying where you delegate. Um, tasks as well okay so so let's assume you're left with uh, things in your day that are meaningful they are furthering your purpose they should be done by you right and they're either on a to-do list or they are things that you're doing right now everything else you've either canned or you have delegated so you're left with the things that are important um, and either urgent or on your to-do list. So now it's about uh, staying focused. And when I've spoken to people about productivity in the past, quite often this is the, the main challenge people have. And I have a book recommendation for you that's not on the list at the end because I've only recently finished it and I'm going to be doing a webinar, um, a podcast, sorry, with our business psychologist partner, Hazel, about this book because she recommended it to me and it's called Stolen Focus by, I think it's Johan Hari. Um, I can't recommend it enough. And in fact, if you subscribe to Blinklist, which is the sort of book summary thing, um, which is, again, very good if you want to absorb concepts from books in a very short amount of time rather than dedicating hours and hours to reading or listening to the full version. Um, Stolen Focus is about um, why people aren't able to stay focused on, on tasks the way we perhaps used to. And, you know, the very simplistic um, excuse people often give is, you know, social media, you know, the on-demand nature of living now. The book goes into sort of the impacts of those things, but it it's far transcends just a simple put your phone away, basically. So what we've got here are a few techniques that I think are realistic given the world we live in. Right, I'm not going to tell you, you know, that you need to sit in a darkened room, <laughs> right, with no distractions and all the rest of it, because the reality is, um, if you're anything like me, you know, you're, you're doing important tasks but part of your job is to answer the phone to customers or to liaise with partners and you can't just ignore those things that happen so try to keep this rooted in the real world in that you need to stay focused on the tasks you're doing but it's not realistic just to tell you to ignore your phone or switch them off during the day that is part of your your work so we're is we're up here basically so we've find the tasks that are purpose furthering. You are the best person to do the job. So now we're looking at distractions. 
right? If you're easily distracted, we have some techniques. Um, some of you might be aware of the Pomodoro technique. And if you're wondering why a tomato, it's because I understand Pomodoro is Italian for tomato and it wasn't Italian that discovered this technique. Um, Right. Uh, so we've got the Pomodoro and I think one more technique um, that is quite effective and can be adapted to suit you um, to, to help, you know, stay focused on those tasks in hand before we move on to, you know, the next technique. So the Pomodoro technique, I would say that, you know, you don't need to follow it verbatim as well. And I think this is a mistake people do with the um, with the Pomodoro technique is they say, well, it must be exactly like this no some version of it is absolutely fine you must do what works for you um i do do a version of this um that i use um i'm going to say her name but she's going to start talking to me uh, alexa to put the alarms on um while uh, while i'm working and then the alarm goes off and i go and take my break but the pomodoro technique is quite useful for when i need to stay focused on proposal writing oh, yeah you see i knew she'd go off um for when uh you know i'm writing proposals or something for marketing um and i need to stay focused usually when there's some sort of deadline that i must meet so the pomodoro technique in a in a nutshell is decide your task so most people have got some form of to-do list. If you don't, I absolutely applaud you um, for, for being able to, you know, have a, uh, you know, work that you can tackle on demand. But some people have a list of things that they need to do. And then the idea is you set a timer and the Pomodoro technique talks about 25 minutes. And I think that's based on, you know, the amount of time that people can realistically be expected to focus on. Now, in stolen focus, it's really interesting. Apparently, our average attention span is about three minutes or something crazy like that. It was, it was way, way lower than you think it is. Um, and I started to think about it and I was thinking about the things I do during the day and you know, the way emails pop up and the way you might check your phone and scary but it probably is something like three minutes um so in this you set a timer for 25 minutes so you work on the task until your alarm goes off whatever that looks like or however you manage that and then the idea is you take an enforced break okay now the reason i say this is sort of a guide is because if you're in a fantastic flow and it sometimes happens and um again, stolen focus talks about this state of flow that people can get into then i wouldn't take a break OK, if you are in a really good flow, if I'm mid sentence you know, on a proposal or in a in a presentation for a client, the last thing I would do at that point is, is stop and make myself take a break. <laughs> OK, um, but if you're working on something and you've got a, a, you know, a reasonable focus going, but actually you take the break and then you come back to it, this can be quite useful. Um, so, it, yeah, so a helpful technique adapt it for what works for you and the idea is then you do that four times so you're looking at a two hour chunk and then at the end of that you take a longer break so a walk yeah we've got a sofa there whatever it is that that relaxes you um i like to walk the dog because i find i have lots of you know um lots of my ideas and creative thinking comes when i'm out walking without any other distractions around me rather than sitting down with the telly or listening to an audiobook or something which is engaging my brain in a different way um yeah so um i think the, the key points to note are in this blue box here so the goal of the technique is to reduce the impact of interruptions and focus on that flow of the task um if you get interrupted right it's not saying you know you ignore it so if you get a phone call um you know take the call record whatever it is you know you need to do next and then you know wait until the end of your pomodoro cycle um or just abandon the cycle and deal with whatever the call was about so you've got to do what feels right at the time um yeah, uh, interested to know if anybody has used this or how they adapted it for them or whether you literally stick to this. If you have, just pop it in the chat. Um, pop it in the chat and uh, it'd be really interesting to see if people uh, use this. Like I say, I use this very flexibly. I don't use it all the time. I use it for those um, urgent tasks usually. So goodness, I've got to do this by tomorrow or by lunchtime today or right, I need to stay really focused. And that's when the timer goes on. And um, and yeah, and quite often, I probably say 50 percent of the time I, I, I work through a couple 
of these 25 minute cycles before I take a break, just because I might hopefully, fingers crossed, get into that state of flow whereby I don't need a break. But then as soon as then I find my mind start wandering, I stop and take a break. And then I go back to setting timers again and working on tasks. It depends where your where your mind's at. So again, yeah, please share if you have used it. Um, I think Sam that's on the call from Odessi um, possibly does something like this. I know she walks the dog as well and things like that. But um, yeah, Pomodoro technique. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, if you've used that. There's some other similar methods um so this one is the 60 10 method you you probably heard of this one as well but it this one's used by um by athletes when training which i found really interesting because i was um originally writing this presentation uh during the olympics last year um so you know it's all about you know athletes and how they work and how they continuously improve but i thought this was a really interesting method so um used by elite athletes um so the idea is you switch off all your technology and distraction there are some good you know techniques for switching things off if you need to have your phone available you know for important work calls some things I've seen other people say is that they put like their personal phone in the other room because if it was really urgent people would call you on your work number or on the home number um uh, I sometimes switch off the notifications on my laptop so I get those little boxes that pop up to say I've got emails well does it matter you know if I wait until the end of my next um, you know, uh, till the end of the next hour before I check my emails? Probably not. Very few things we get through actually requires a response within an hour. So you can, you know, switch off your distractions for this cycle. And the idea is you work for an hour and then you take a 10 minute break and you work for an hour and you take a 10 minute break. You can see it's exactly the same premise as the Pomodoro technique. And again, it's just finding a flow that works for you. If you get into those states of flow, then 60 minutes might be better. Yeah, it's com completely up to you to find the, the balance uh, for yourselves. Okay, again, if you've used any of these and there are, there are some other very similar ones, then, then do just let us know how you found it. Okay, and this is where then if you are doing things to further your purpose, if you are the right person to be doing them, you don't need to delegate the task. And if you are being productive in your time, so if you are, sorry, minimizing distractions, if you're minimizing distractions, then we need to look at, lastly, the efficiency of the tasks you complete. Now, I've done it in this order because I can't tell you how many times as, 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 as lean continuous improvement consultants, people come to us to ask us to improve processes or yeah processes that they do but actually they shouldn't be doing that process to start with and that comes back to that first point on the chart which is actually is this something that furthers your purpose is it value adding in the first place um i've got a quote at the end i can't remember it exactly so excuse the sloppy wording but it's something like there is nothing more pointless than doing a task that you shouldn't have done in the first place yeah so actually you can only be you can do um a task that nobody wants really efficiently but actually you've not you've not delivered any value doing that at all so you should always ask those first few questions make sure you're only doing the things that you need to be doing and then look at efficiency it's this idea of effectiveness first do the things that make you effective and then do them efficiently uh, in fact when we do a when we deliver a different webinar um on measurement we often use the example um, about, about targets and about, you know, if you are dropped in the middle of a desert, if you've been kidnapped and thrown out in the middle of the desert or in the middle of the jungle, efficiency is walking quickly. Effectiveness is taking the time to work out which direction you need to work or walk in. Right. And then you walk quickly. <laughs> so become effective, make sure you're doing the right things, then do them quickly. And I've got other quotes um, I'll share with you. Uh, in the follow-up email like Bill Gates that talks about you know um, doing things quickly that aren't effective and you know all the rest of it so we've gone through those first few stages we're making sure we're not distracted so we've taken away those 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 obvious distractions and we're now looking at whether we complete tasks efficiently okay so are we doing them efficiently and if the answer is yes then great 
you're, you're, you've got rid of distractions, you're doing tasks efficiently, you're the best person to do them, you're furthering your purpose, the chances are you are spending most of your time being productive. Okay, but I'm going to assume that most people um, recognize that uh, they don't do everything as efficiently as possible. Now, that is not a personal judgment. OK, there is all sorts of things that detracts from task efficiency, process efficiency that's not within your gift uh, or is the, the problems are not generated by yourself. You, know, you are one of a team. You are one of a larger organization. There's all sorts of things that would uh, impact the efficiency of the way you do things. Um, I can see on the call I've got um, a colleague um, client from an edu uh, education facility from a university. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a human resources department, whether you work in human resources in any organization, you quite often are reliant on people providing information to you. Yes, so you require information, you know, about the candidate for recruitment or about the job you're recruiting to or whatever that is. Um, and if you don't get that information properly or completely, then there will be all sorts of inefficiencies in the process that, in, that, that make what you do more inefficient. But the inefficiency wasn't generated by you, if you see what I mean. So do you complete task efficiency? The answer is no, but that doesn't mean that it's your fault, if you see what I mean. It's a fault of the process, the wider process. So we can use a technique like the seven wastes, yeah, to remove waste and get yourself organized. And it's a really effective way of, of, of becoming more efficient, yeah, of reducing waste in your process and therefore giving yourself more time to add value which makes you more productive uh, some of you will have seen the seven ways before again just looking through the people that have joined and the people that are going to get this recording I know a number of you have worked with us and have probably heard me or G or one of the team talk about the seven ways till we're blue in the face I'm going to do it again um, so seven wastes right this is the concept that everything you do everything you do does one of two things you either add value for your customer, yeah? So we're adding value for that customer or we're not. And if we're not adding value, we are adding cost in the form of waste. So waste is anything that doesn't add value uh, to your product or service, ultimately to your customer, okay? And everything, every task, everything you do adds value or waste. Now, waste comes in a few different categories. For the purposes of this, that's irrelevant. It's either value or waste. OK, and the most challenging thing with the seven ways is learning to see it. OK, because um, the traditional way we manage tasks and the traditional way we're taught to think in, in the UK workplace, you know, um, it doesn't naturally align to this concept of the seven ways. So the first thing you do is learn to see it. So I would consider it a huge win if after this webinar today, the one thing you take away from it is this ability to spot at least one of these wastes in the workplace and you actively engage in reducing it. I'm a huge believer, as you can tell from our purpose statement in continuous improvement, seven wastes is the ultimate tool for reducing, uh, you know, for increasing productivity, for reducing waste, for improving services, for driving continuous improvement in a nutshell. OK, so first learn to see waste, which I'm going to walk you through now, then set about eliminating and reducing it. And doing that will free up time from your working day and the working day of your colleagues. OK, usually by reducing some sort of waste, it has a, a positive impact on other people as well, because you've done something that other people will benefit from. OK, uh, so examples are Tedesi and we talk about. 1% um, improvements every day on our daily meeting. Um, I'm not going to lie and say every single day we have something, but we have several things a week and it might be that a template has been updated. Uh, so we have a sales proposal template um, and there was always one section I was adding in and one section I was taking out from our standard template. And I eventually got around to talking to, um, to, to Sam that manages all things beautiful in our organization and saying, can, can, you, can you adjust the template to do this? And that's a 1% improvement because that means not only do I not have to do that every time, which was minutes every time I produced a proposal, it also means my colleagues in Odessi, the right proposals, also get the benefit of that improvement and they're not doing that. And you're probably thinking, what a terribly minor example. Not at all. They are minutes 
this is what continuous improvement is all about. It's about those, the adding up of the, the little minutes every single day. And again, uh, James Clear in um, Atomic Habits, which was a very popular, is a, is a very popular book and has been really popular through the pandemic, you know, talks about those 1% improvements every day and how they add up. That's the sort of thing that will, will really boost your productivity. And again, sign up for our newsletter because I've got a, uh, an email tomorrow about continuous improvement coming out that talks a little bit more about this. But the seven wastes that you need to learn to see are these seven on this slide. Um, so we start, I'm going to walk you through them one by one. Again, use the chat or the Q&A if you have any questions. I, I do think this is, you know, a really important point and you won't get these straight away. Some of these are really hard to spot and some of them are quite counterintuitive. Um, some of them are, are really obvious. <laughs> so the first one is the hardest one to, to grasp and probably the most counterintuitive. That's why I'm going to cover it first. And it's overproduction. So doing something before it's needed by the customer or whoever the customer is of your stage in the process, so by the next person, or producing too much of something, more than you need to produce, is what we call overproduction. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So in the charity sector, if you're a fundraising team, you often order things for your events, like T-shirts, like bags, like leaflets and stuff like that. Yeah, how often do these printing places have a, you know, buy a thousand for... 100 quid and 2,000 for 101 pounds, <laughs> you know, stupid offers like that. And so you order more than you need or you order just in case. But of course, those extra things you've ordered need to be stored somewhere. Yeah. How often do charities go through rebrands or change the address or just tweak little details that mean all the stuff you've ordered is now wasted? And then that becomes, you know, physical waste as well. Yeah. So you should always just do what is needed just in time as well. Um, you don't want to do something too quick because the chances are that it will just sit in a queue waiting for someone else to pick it up and then something changes. Yeah, so uh, example, I've talked about, uh, you know, writing proposals to Desi. We do a lot of that. We respond to tenders as well. Um, let's say the tender date is in a month's time. If I wrote the whole proposal now and put all the effort in on it, and then um, you know we were still in the Q and A period for the tender response, and as a result of the Q and A, the tender specification got changed, it's because I did it too quickly. I did it before it was needed. The chances are then I need to go back and rework a lot of what I've done, rather than you know perhaps doing the bits I could do immediately, like the questions and the outline, and then making sure I did it just in time. So quite a counterintuitive concept yes don't do it too early don't do more than you need to do it just in time and just enough okay so that's overproduction that is a waste and it is the worst of all the wastes as well because it leads to all the other wastes so the second one is waiting or idle time so uh, waiting for an approval waiting for someone to come back to you it's a process wait it doesn't mean I think that people sit there twiddling their thumbs sometimes they do but uh, quite often we just switch to different tasks but the task you are working on is still waiting the more handovers you have in a process the more waiting generally you have uh, there's a rule of thumb that says a quick process is a good process OK, the more waiting you have, uh, the more inventory. So things sat around waiting in queues, the more recapping you have to do on what needs to happen next, um, generally the worst. So waiting is a process. However, if it comes to a trade off between do I do this, uh, you know, between overproduction, so doing something too fast and waiting, you should always wait rather than do something too quickly. Uh, weird, I know, but. Yes, that's the general rule of thumb. And let's be clear, no waste free process exists. These will always exist in some way, shape or form. And this is why it's called continuous improvement. You will never get a waste free process. Never. Because of the nature of these wastes, all you're ever doing is sometimes trading one type of waste for another and quite often just reducing it. You can remove certain types of waste, but there will still be waste in a process. 
I used to do an exercise with people where I'd get them to map the process of making a cup of tea and people are always horrified by how much waste is in the process I don't do that now for two reasons in training uh one is that people stop offering to make me cups of tea which was depressing uh the second reason is that um uh, people couldn't agree on whether the milk went in first or second and I don't want to spark this debate here now but um let's just say uh you know it almost resulted in 50 cuffs more than once um so yeah it became too controversial now we do something easy like um you know how you manage recruitment <laughs> uh, think or processing expenses and things like that so all joking aside overproduction the worst of all the wastes waiting is a waste as well the next one is excess processing so where you do more steps in your process than are necessary um some people will often describe this as using a sledgehammer to crack a nut so i have to record the fact that i have seen someone today for an appointment let's say i work in an industry where that's important and i record it on the main database right and then i record it on my spreadsheet and then i record it in my blue book yeah that's all those extra steps that were completely unnecessary now the fact that you are required to record in the first place is waste okay you might be thinking yes but how would we know it's still waste the customer wouldn't pay for that step it's something you do because you have to do it internally so therefore you do it as efficiently as possible so we have a database called hubspot i'm sure some of you are familiar with it we, we, we have the benefit of being private sector so we can you know pick our systems and don't have a lot of the restrictions that our clients do but for me recording that sort of detail is as easy as just ticking a box on my email when i send it so it will record emails and context and everything for me so that waste for me is a second to tick the box whereas it might be some you know some of our clients have to copy and paste the content of emails or write the details of their appointments into the new database well okay that's now a waste step that's taking you know five minutes and that's pretty good but then if you're recording it in a spreadsheet okay that's still excess steps that's that's more waste and then uh you know recording it in the book as well that's more waste you can see how something that could theoretically take a second to do now takes you know 30 minutes to do for example um let me give you the example of expenses processing i imagine again looking looking down the list most of you have to process expenses at some time so a uh, little insight again, when I joined Odessi, we kept all our receipts. Every month we would fill in a spreadsheet, which involved me sitting in the middle of the floor with all the receipts I had around me basically crying, <laughs> trying to match it up to my diary. Um, so we, it would take ages. Every month I'd do the expenses, I'd fill in a spreadsheet, I would hole punch the, the receipts together, I'd put a treasury tag through them, they would go in the post, they'd go to our accountant who would do all the checking, who would come back to me and say, we've got missing expenses, blah, 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 and all that to and front. All of that is waste. The customer, um, you know, does not pay for you to process expenses. They want you to be value for money. They don't pay for you to, um, to, to, to do the expenses. Okay, so it's a waste step. Now, when we do expenses, we have an app on our phone. We photograph the receipt. It analyzes it for us. We fill in about three fields, click, 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 and that's it, right? So from, from hours of work and waste to seconds. OK, so still waste in that process. It's still waste. It just takes a lot. It's just a lot quicker. OK, but that's excess processing, doing more than you need to to get to the outcome that you require. So this is where now I start getting a little bit unreasonable. OK, so overproduction, waiting, excess processing, hopefully make a bit of sense to you. Um, but let's now talk about transportation. OK, so anything you move around to process is waste. So if you are transferring files from one site to another, if you are taking things to be physically signed, now I'll admit that um, two of these wastes in particular have been significantly reduced since COVID because we found better, more effective ways to do things. Things are generally done more electronically. Transportation, the example I used to use was invoices. People would post paper invoices into the organization. They would get sent to finance who would open them, who would send them out to the business to do something. Um, they'd send them back to finance. And, uh, you know, it used to be very burdensome. Now it tends to be all electronic, which is great. But anything you move around the processing, uh, so if you are processing a benefits claim or something like that, anything where there's something physical that you need to transport, that's a waste. Okay. We then have inventory. Inventory is very much linked to waiting. 
things that are waiting tend to be sat in a queue somewhere. So inventory literally means a pile of stuff that you're not working on at the moment, electronic or physical. So it used to be in and out trays or piles of files on desks and things like that. These days, it tends to be workflow queues, uh, emails, voicemails, right, to-do lists, anything that you've, that's been started that's not being actively worked on right now is inventory. OK, and that's another way. So, again, learning to spot that and saying, actually, how can we work on things in single piece flow wherever possible so we can finish one thing before something else gets started? That's the trick there. And then we move on to motion. So motion, again, is very linked to transportation. Yeah, usually if you're moving something, you are also moving. But uh, motion is additionally time spent, you know, physically moving to perform your role. So um, again, very much reduced um, because of COVID. Um, but you know, if you have to travel for a meeting, regardless of whether that meeting is value adding or not, the time you spend traveling for the meeting is still waste because you are still moving for your job. If you go to pick up something from the printer, right? That's transportation and motion, by the way, when you bring it back, but that is still motion if you are um you know going from one floor to another for a meeting or from one site to another for a meeting that's motion if you are having to go out to see customers so if you are a repairs technician and you have to obviously travel to someone's home to complete a repair or if you are a social worker and you have to go out to your client's homes or a district nurse and you have to travel the traveling is waste now, I can't see any questions or Q&As coming through, but um, in your mind, I imagine you're probably thinking, well, you can't do your job without that. So how is that waste? You have to travel. And the answer is, yes, you do have to travel. But the travel itself is still waste. The value you add is when you're there. This is why you get very clever scheduling systems to try and reduce that motion as much as possible because we recognize it's waste. If teleportation was invented tomorrow, would you use it? to get from one to another, would you reduce that travel as much as possible? Absolutely you would. So therefore motion is waste. And then the last one, the seventh waste, defects, sometimes called errors and rework. Any time spent producing stuff that is wrong or rejected, and then all your subsequent corrections uh, is also waste. So if you receive forms with incorrect fields or missing fields, Right. All the time somebody spent filling that in is wasted and all the time you spent correcting it is wasted as well. Um, so, yes, defects, hopefully a slightly more obvious waste there. But uh, any time we do something that's wrong and then correcting it is, is also waste. Now, in consult, this is very sad, but in consultancy circles, there's often a lot of debate about whether it's seven, eight wastes, eight wastes, nine wastes, 30, 10 wastes. And the point is the whole conversation is a waste in itself. OK, there are other ways people talk about the eighth, um, probably most hotly debated one is people under utilization. So you have expertise that you are not utilizing. And yeah, sure, that's a waste. OK, but I think uh, I think everybody, once you're comfortable with the concept of waste, is able to identify, uh, you know, the types of waste in the workplace. The point about the seven wastes is these are the classic, these are the original seven. Just get people identifying needs. If you can get people using this terminology and you can get people saying, well, actually, you know, it would be if we could reduce the weight there. If, you know, if if you signed off these forms when we're in this meeting together, rather than me pulling it together afterwards and then bringing it to you. And then there's the waste. If I presented it to you and then you signed it off, that would reduce the waste here. Brilliant. Right. If we say, actually, um, if we buy one of these projectors and, or screens and we keep it in this office, we won't have to move it around. Brilliant. Yes, if we say that actually this meeting can be virtual so we can reduce that motion. Brilliant. OK, you just learning to see it and then learning to reduce it even fractionally will make a huge difference uh, once you start adding up all of those incremental improvements. OK, so this is a big way to impact your productivity, but only if you're applying it to things that you should be doing it in the first place. So hence why it's all the way down our productivity tree um, because it's the last consideration but it's really critical I'm not again not seeing any questions or anything in the chat on the seven ways hopefully that was an okay explanation <laughs> I'm sure uh, certainly my clients on the call will tell me if it was a bit rubbish later um, so that's the you know the seven ways 
So I want to pause there and just go through some 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 more generic top tips for being effective. Okay, things that uh, I, I polled a few um, sort of close clients and, uh, and and friends about how they stay effective through the day, how you remain productive. Um, and some of these tips won't apply to everybody. It depends on the nature of your work, particularly this first tip. So work when you are in the zone. And I'm sure you're all aware of this concept of, you know, night owls um, and morning larks. And some people are better in the morning. Some people are better at night. I personally work better in the morning. My real poor time for working, um, working at home anyway, is probably around three o'clock. I really have a lull then. So I would try and avoid doing anything, you know, on my own at that time. I take a break around there. If I'm with clients, it's fine. I've got their energy. But um, for me, I wouldn't be writing proposals at that time unless I absolutely had to, because I know that's not my productive time. My business partner, G, he's often sending me stuff at one in the morning because that's apparently when he feels energized. <laughs> um, so if you are in a job where you can where you can have some degree of control over when you work, accept that you're not productive at particular times of the day and just don't work it. I think we are moving more towards a culture now where people are more accepting of where well, you can be anyway of, you know, um, you know, taking a break or going to the gym in the middle of the day or adapting your work hours to suit to suit what works. And I think people are becoming more com comfortable with the concept now of of being outcome focused rather than the whole presenteeism, you know, type culture that we used to have. So, yeah, if you can work when you are in the zone. Next tip. Try and work on one thing at a time. I'm sure you've heard uh, many times before that multitasking is not productive. And it's absolutely right. That's because you have to, your brain power to be able to switch from one task to another is, you know, fairly significant. Um, you have to remind yourself what you were doing. There's the change over time for tasks. If you're able to do one thing at a time, then do. Now, for me, that's just not 100% possible. But what I do do is I make sure that I minimize things I'm working on at once. So particularly if you are just one person in a chain of tasks, you know, uh, I might have, um, you know, proofed a, a campaign that's being sent out or written a proposal. I'm waiting for somebody to do something else. I'm obviously going to pick up another task, even if it's going to come back to me. But really minimize the amount of things you're doing at one time. And, you know, in any any set period, just try and do one thing at a time. It's, it's, a, it's a big tip for trying to be productive. And I know when you're really busy, the, the temptation, the natural urge is to try and pick up lots of things at once. But I guarantee to you that that is a surefire way to kill your productivity. Just go into any cafe and compare cafes where they literally work on one drink at a time. Doesn't matter how big the queue is, they work on the customer in front of them and through to completion and give you your drinks versus those that start loads of drinks and loads of orders at once. Uh, watch what happens. Productivity absolutely takes a nosedive. So does customer satisfaction. So does quality. So does everything. So yes, focus on a task at a time. I found this particularly helpful, particularly if you're a procrastinator or if there are tasks that you don't particularly like. Uh, I tend to write my to-do list. It says the night before you start work. It's the last thing I do the day before um, when I finish when I finish on a day ready for the next day. So writing that to-do list to say, actually, here's what I need to do tomorrow and here's the order I'm going to do it in, takes away any morning procrastination you might have. Stops you looking at and going, oh, I'll just do that later. Or, yeah, I don't really want to do that. Because actually all those decisions have been made for you. So my schedule today, you know, said I am going to do our daily meeting. I'm going to have this call with G. I'm then going to run this webinar. I'm then going to call this person. I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to go and walk the dog. And it sounds ridiculous, you know, and uh, the timings for that might change slightly. But I have uh, an ordered list which says these are the things I need to do in this order. And that really helps because it means the brain power first thing in the morning that's required is, is slightly lesser. And that's with me being a morning uh, person as well. OK, um, the next tip, keep a Kanban style list of tasks or jobs that you, you do or you need to do. Don't, um, 
some of you might be familiar with the concept of Kanban. I'm really sorry if I'm teaching you to suck eggs, um, uh, but some people I, I, I don't know on the call. Um, Kanban uh, in this concept context is the idea of a, a to do, doing and done sort of list. So you have tasks and you move them between those categories. So here's your to do stuff. When you're doing it, you move it into the doing and then when it's done, you move it across. And the idea of a Kanban is it stops you starting too much. So it, it helps with that one task at a time focus, because actually if you've moved loads of things over into doing, and one tip I'll give you from today, or one of many tips, hopefully, but one thing I recommend you do after this call is you, is you create one of these and for, for where you're at now. And actually, if you've got lots of things in your doing column, that's probably why you feel you're not being very productive. You cannot mentally keep track of so many things at once. And with a Kanban, what you should do is you should assign a limit to the number of things you can have in progress. So uh, mine says five, for example. Um, it needs to be fairly flexible, but five. I know if I'm coming up to five things in my doing list, then actually, rather than starting something else, I should really see which of those that I can progress and finish. It stops me being tempted to pick up the next sexy task on the list or the thing I really fancy. And actually, I've just got to get on with this and finish this and moving into done. And when I've done that, I can then move something else over. So a Kanban is a really helpful sort of concept. If you're interested in that, uh, we have got a, like a one pager. If you go to our website, uh, which is www.ad hyphen e double -S, s e so add s e with the hyphen in the middle dot com and then you'll see something called the knowledge hub under guides there's a guide for a kanban uh, it's a really really simple concept but really helpful for for managing your to-do list um harnessing the 80 20 rule some of you will know that as a pareto analysis the idea here is that um 80 of your time is spent on 20 percent of the tasks and again i think we have an infographic for that on the website. Um, hopefully Sam's on this call. If not, Sam, can we upload it? <laughs> um, she did a fantastic illustration for the end of 20 rule. It applies to pretty much everything. So the idea is, you know, 80% uh, of the apps on your, um, sorry, 20% of the apps on your phone take up 80% of your, your phone browsing time. And it's absolutely true, right? I've got like five apps. I've got hundreds of apps on my phone I probably use you know, um, very few of them. In fact, it's probably even more stark than 80-20 rule these days. But 80% of your time will be spent doing 20% of the things on your to-do list. So the idea is that don't improve or look for the wastes in the smaller tasks you do. Find the 20% of the things you do that takes up 80% of your time and improve the efficiency of those. Yeah. So if you spend, uh, you know, 80% of your time report writing, okay. Let's find the reports then that actually aren't adding any value that people don't want that you can cull. Let's find, uh, you know, how we can do it more productively. Let's find ways we can focus on those better and you'll get a bigger, bigger bang for your buck really. Okay, by harnessing this 80-20 rule. Um, yeah, the, the next idea is this idea of just do it. Yeah, if a task takes less than 10 minutes, again, I wouldn't even bother with the Eisenhower matrix. If it is something really quick, don't schedule it, just do it. Uh, and I try to apply that to my emails. I have a look at them and it actually, if it's something I can reply to quickly or they're asking for something that's really quick, I try and apply this basic 10 minute rule and then I just do it. Okay. Ooh, okay, and that was it for sort of extra top tips for being, for being effective. Okay. Um, and that sort of brings us to a close, um, which isn't bad because it's 10.52 uh, and I've put an hour in for this. Um, one of the things I recommend that you, you do from this webinar, I'm really conscious, I've been to loads of webinars. Um, I like to attend them, I like to continuously learn. I think it's really interesting. Hopefully you found this interesting and I haven't just rehashed all the things you've heard about before. Hopefully I've given you some logic towards it. Um, but I find that uh, having something practical to do after a webinar like this sometimes really helps. So I can recommend to you this grid, start, stop, more or less. So if all you do now in the last few minutes you'll have um, after this webinar is you sit and on your piece of paper, you sketch out the, the things I've talked about that actually you think you're going to start doing because you liked that idea. Um, uh, and then things that actually you're going to stop doing that might be reports or it might be, you know, responding to certain types of emails or it might be copying people into things. Um, you know, what, what would you stop doing? 
what things are you going to do more of because it increases your productivity and what are things that you can't stop but you might do less of you know actually helps you take concepts from a session like this and makes it practical so you'll actually go away with a, a tangible benefit from this webinar rather than just you know having sat for for 50 minutes listening to me ramble on so start, stop, more, less. I will send a follow-up with information on. And here are the, some of those quotes that I, I mentioned. There's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that we should not be done at all. That was the one I, I butchered earlier. That's Peter Drucker. Um, Tim Ferriss, uh, again, lots of fantastic books from Tim Ferriss, focused on being productive instead of busy. And there's a huge difference in those definitions. Um, I like this one from Henry Ford. Uh, improved productivity means less human sweat, not more. You can see how all of these are very, you know, sort of linked, playing to the same points, but these are great quotes. Here's a few of those recommended reads. Um, I will pop in the email as well, the um, Stolen Focus from Johan um, Hari. Um, but these are really good as well. The 5AN Club, we do have a podcast talking to somebody in housing about their experience applying the 5AN Club. Really, really interesting about those um, daily routines and habits. I do like Eat That Frog. Again, we have a podcast on that, actually, with um, the Chief Executive of Power, the advocacy charity, where she talks about how she tried to apply that. There's this book here called um, Deep Work, which, again, was really interesting about focus. So very much like that Stolen Focus book. That one's very good. And and I do love Stephen R. Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And that's a very slim read, but it is very short, sharp and to the point. And the reason I have a particular um, love of that book is when I was a new consultant, I wrote to Stephen Covey to tell him how much I enjoyed it and how much I liked, uh, how much I'd used the concepts in the book. And he actually emailed me back, which I thought was um, amazing. Um, yeah, so those books uh, are very much recommended from your favorite bookseller. And then lastly, we run loads of different webinars. We're about to switch up our program and start niching down on some things that people are asking us about. Um, we put out loads of free material and uh, you know videos and prompt sheets and stuff. If you're interested in productivity and performance improvement, um, in continuous improvement, if you love continuous improvement, like us, like, you know, please follow us. Um, please sign up to our mailing list. You will get stuff and if you don't like it you can unsubscribe um and i'm gonna put my video back on and say i can't see any q a or chat right now um if anybody has any questions that you want to contact me about directly i'm gonna send you an email with uh with like the slides um it'll be tomorrow now with the sketch note we need to give sam a chance to pull it together um so you've got some notes from the session today but do feel free to reach out to me personally. Um, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn as well, Rhiannon Gibbs. Um, but great. Mm, feel free to stick hands up if you have any questions as well. Anything from anybody? If not, then I will say thanks awfully for attending. Hopefully you found that useful. I think there's a little uh, Q&A at the end where we just say, did you find this useful or not? Um, obviously I can't improve them if, uh, I don't know what the problems were, but thanks for coming and uh, hope to see you at another webinar.